I'm Nermeen Sheikh. Welcome to our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. In a nationally televised address, President Obama announced he was putting off a plan to strike Syria while pursuing a diplomatic effort from Russia for international monitors to take over and destroy Syria's arsenal of chemical weapons. The speech came just 10 days after he told the nation he would ask Congress to authorize using military force. On Tuesday night, Obama asked congressional leaders to put off a vote on his request to authorize the use of military strikes, but he said the military would remain ready if diplomacy fails. America's not the world's policeman. Terrible things happen across the globe, and it is beyond our means to right every wrong. But when, with modest effort and risk, we can stop children from being gassed to death, and thereby make our own children safer over the long run, I believe we should act. That's what makes America different. That's what makes us exceptional. With humility, but with resolve, let us never lose sight of that essential truth. President Obama offered a qualified endorsement of the Russian proposal to secure Syria's chemical weapons arsenal. Today, we've seen some encouraging signs in part because of the credible threat of U.S. military action, as well as constructive talks that I had with President Putin, the Russian government has indicated a willingness to join with the international community in pushing Assad to give up his chemical weapons. The Assad regime has now admitted that it has these weapons, and even said they joined the Chemical Weapons Convention, which prohibits their use. It's too early to tell whether this offer will succeed. And any agreement must verify that the Assad regime keeps its commitments. But this initiative has the potential to remove the threat of chemical weapons without the use of force, particularly because Russia is one of Assad's strongest allies. I have therefore asked the leaders of Congress to postpone a vote to authorize the use of force while we pursue this diplomatic path. I'm sending Secretary of State John Kerry to meet his Russian counterpart on Thursday. And I will continue my own discussions with President Putin. I've spoken to the leaders of two of our closest allies, France and the United Kingdom. And we will work together in consultation with Russia and China to put forward a resolution at the UN Security Council requiring Assad to give up his chemical weapons and to ultimately destroy them under international control. We'll also give UN inspectors the opportunity to report their findings about what happened on August 21st. And we will continue to rally support from allies from Europe to the Americas, from Asia to the Middle East, who agree on the need for action. Meanwhile, I've ordered our military to maintain their current posture, to keep the pressure on Assad, and to be in a position to respond if diplomacy fails. To talk more about President Obama's speech and the crisis in Syria, we're joined by the world-renowned political dissident, linguist, author, MIT professor Noam Chomsky. He's authored numerous books. His latest is on Western terrorism, from Hiroshima to drone warfare. That's out next week. He joins us via Democracy Now! video stream from his home in Massachusetts. Uh, Noam, welcome to Democracy Now! First, let's get your response to President Obama announcing last night in a nationwide wide address, which I'm sure was watched worldwide, uh, that for the moment there would be no strike on Syria uh, as the U.S. Uh, supports a Russian um, plan uh, to deal with the chemical weapons stockpile of Syria. Well, the Russian plan is a godsend for Obama. It saves him from what would look like a very serious political defeat. Uh, he has not been able to obtain virtually any international support uh, for this, uh, the action he's contemplating. Uh, even Britain wouldn't support it. Uh, and it looked as though Congress wasn't going to support it either, which would leave him completely out on a limb. Uh, this uh, leaves him a way out. He can maintain the threat of force, which incidentally is a crime under international law. We should bear in mind that the core principle of the United Nations Charter bars the threat or use of force, threat or use of force. So all of this is criminal to begin with, but he'll continue with that. The United States is a 
rogue state. It doesn't pay any attention to international law. Uh, he uh, it was kind of interesting what he didn't say. Uh, this would be a perfect opportunity to um, ban uh, chemical weapons, uh, either to, to impose the Chemical Weapons Convention on the Middle East. The convention, contrary to what Obama said, does not specifically refer just to use of chemical weapons. It refers to production, storage, or use of chemical weapons. That's banned by the international norm that uh, Obama likes to preach about. Well, there is a country uh, which happens to be—happens uh, to have illegally annexed part of uh, Syrian territory which has chemical weapons and is in violation of the uh, uh, Chemical Weapons Convention and has refused uh, uh, even to ratify it, uh, namely Israel. So here's an opportunity to eliminate chemical weapons from the region, to uh, impose the Chemical Weapons Convention as it's actually formulated. But Obama was very careful not to say that, uh, he, for reasons which are too obvious to go into. Uh, he uh, And that gap is uh, highly significant. Of course, chemical weapons should be uh, eliminated everywhere, but certainly in that region. Uh, the uh, other things that he said were not unusual, but uh, nevertheless kind of shocking uh, to anyone not familiar with uh, U.S. political discourse, at least. So he described the United—he said that for seven decades, the United States has been the anchor of global security. Really? Seven decades? Now, that includes, for example, just 40 years ago uh, today, when the United States played a major role in uh, overthrowing the parliamentary democracy of Chile and uh, imposing a brutal dictatorship called the first 9-11 in Latin America. Uh, go back earlier years, overthrowing the parliamentary system in Iran, imposing a dictatorship, uh, same in Guatemala a year later, attacking Indo Indochina, worst crime in the post-war period, killing millions of people, uh, attacking Central America, uh, killing uh, involved in uh, uh, killing uh, in uh, imposing a dictatorship in the Congo, uh, and uh, invading Iraq. Uh, uh, on and on. That stability, I mean, that a Harvard Law School graduate can pronounce those words is pretty amazing, as, as is the fact that they're uh, accepted without comment. So what he said is, uh, I'm going to lie uh, like a trooper about history. I'm going to uh, suppress the U.S. role, the actual U.S. role for the last seven decades. I'm going to maintain the threat of force, which is, of course, illegal. And I'm going to ensure that the Chemical Weapons Convention is not imposed on the region because our ally Israel would uh, be subjected to it. I think those are some of the main points of his address. Noam Chomsky. Um, Noam Chomsky, the world-renowned linguist, political dissident. We're going to go to break and then spend the hour with him on President Obama's policy and what's happening in the Middle East. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Back in a minute. Far between sundown's finish and midnight's broken toll. Freedom. Bob Dylan here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our guest for the hour is Professor Noam Chomsky. We're going to turn again back to President Obama, who addressed part of his speech to the nation last night to opponents of military action on the right and left. My fellow Americans, for nearly seven decades, the United States has been the anchor of global security. This has meant doing more than forging international agreements. It has meant enforcing them. The burdens of leadership are often heavy, but the world's a better place because we have borne them. And so, to my friends on the right, I ask you to reconcile your commitment to America's military might with a failure to act when a cause is so plainly just. 
to my friends on the left. I ask you to reconcile your belief in freedom and dignity for all people with those images of children writhing in pain and going still on a cold hospital floor. For sometimes resolutions and statements of condemnation are simply not enough. Indeed, I'd ask every member of Congress and those of you watching at home tonight to view those videos of the attack and then ask, what kind of world will we live in if the United States of America sees a dictator brazenly violate international law with poison gas and we choose to look the other way? That was President Obama addressing the nation last night. Professor Noam Chomsky, your response to his description of those who oppose military strike against Syria for a chemical weapons attack? Well, once again, what's uh, particularly interesting is what he didn't say. So, yes, uh, good idea to look at the videos of the gas attack in Syria. But uh, then we could also look at uh, the photos of uh, deformed fetuses in Saigon hospitals uh, still appearing uh, decades after uh, John F. Kennedy launched a major chemical warfare attack against South Vietnam, 1961, uh, dousing the country with uh, poisonous uh, dioxin-laced uh, uh, Agent Orange dioxins, uh, one of the major carcinogens. Uh, the attack was aimed at uh, food crops uh, in an effort to, and uh, a ground cover, a part of a general assault against the country. Uh, a huge number of uh, atrocities, uh, millions of people killed. The, chemical, the effects of chemical warfare are uh, felt until today, partially by American soldiers, too. Or we could look at the photos of uh, other deformed fetuses coming regularly in uh, Fallujah, uh, attacked by uh, U.S. Marines in November 2004, uh, killing several thousand people, uh, destroying much of the town. Uh, using weapons which of unknown character, but which left radiation levels that epide epidemiologists have uh, estimated are comparable to Hiroshima, and uh, the effects of that on high cancer rates, on uh, deformed fetuses, on uh, children uh, uh, devastated by uh, horrifying uh, deformities, uh, that we could look at, too. Uh, those are the ways in which the U.S. has brought uh, has been the anchor for global security for seven decades. Can run through the record if there were time, but everyone should know it. Uh, these, of course, uh, uh, that's not said. Uh, the U.S. The idea that the U.S. has uh, introduced and imposed uh, principles of international law—that's uh, hardly even a joke. The United States has even gone so far as to veto Security Council resolutions calling on all states to observe international law. That was in the 1980s under Reagan. Uh, no state was mentioned, but it was evident that the intention was uh, to request the United States to observe international law after it had rejected a world court judgment condemning it for what was called unlawful use of force, it means international terrorism, uh, against uh, uh, Nicaragua. In fact, the U.S. has been a rogue state, the leading rogue state, radically violating international law, uh, refusing to accept international conventions. There's hardly any international conventions that the U.S. has accepted, and those few that it has accepted are conditioned so as to be inapplicable to the United States. Uh, 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 that's true even of uh, the Genocide Convention. Uh, the United States is self-authorized to commit genocide. In fact, that was accepted by the International Court of Justice uh, in the case of uh, Yugoslavia versus NATO. Uh, one of the charges was genocide. Uh, the U.S. appealed to the court, uh, saying that by law, the United States is immune to the charge of genocide, self-immunized, and the court accepted that. So the case proceeded against the other NATO powers, but not against the United States. In fact, the United States, when it uh, 
uh, joined the World Court. It helped uh, introduce the modern World Court in 1946 and joined the World Court, but with a reservation. The reservation is that uh, uh, international uh, uh, agreements, uh, laws, do not apply to the United States. So the UN Charter, the Charter of the Organization of American States, uh, the U.S. is immune to their uh, self-immunized, uh, to their requirements against uh, uh, the threat and use of force, intervention, and so on. Uh, it's kind of astonishing. I mean, by now it's hard to be astonished, but it should be astonishing that a president of the United States, who is furthermore a constitutional lawyer, a graduate of Harvard Law School, can say things like this in the full knowledge that the facts are exactly the opposite, radically the opposite. And there are millions and millions of victims who can testify to that. Uh, right today is, happens to be an important date, the 40th anniversary of uh, the overthrow of the parliamentary democracy of Chile with substantial U.S. aid, uh, because uh, we insisted on uh, having a vicious dictatorship, which became a major international terror center with our support, uh, rather than allowing a, a democratic uh, a socialist government. Well, that's th these are some of the realities of the world. Uh, the picture that the president presented is it doesn't even uh, uh, merit the name fairy tale. Well, Professor Noam Chomsky, uh, why do you think that the U.S. Uh, so quickly uh, started to push for military strikes? And what do you think uh, the U.S. or the international community should do to deal with this uh, alleged use of chemical weapons in Syria? What do you think the appropriate response would be? The appropriate response would be to call for imposing the Chemical Weapons Convention in the Middle East, in fact, beyond, but we'll keep to the Middle East, which would mean that any country that is in violation of that convention, whether it has accepted it or not, would be compelled to eliminate its, we its chemical weapons stores. Just maintaining those stores, producing chemical weapons, all of that's in violation of the convention. And now is a perfect opportunity to do that. Of course, that would require that uh, U.S. ally Israel uh, give up its uh, chemical weapons and uh, permit international inspections. Incidentally, this should ex expand, extend to nuclear weapons as well. Uh, we, the a further uh, step would be to uh, 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 to, to move towards. Uh, the kinds of negotiations, Geneva negotiations, that the UN negotiator, Lakhdar Brahimi, uh, has been calling for uh, with Russian support and with the United States kind of dragging its feet. Uh, Obama mi misstated that too last night. Uh, that's the one thin hope, and it's pretty thin, uh, for some way to allow Syria to escape what is in fact a plunge to suicide, virtual suicide. And, and why do you think the U.S. started to push for military action so swiftly? As it always does, the United States is a violent military state. It's been involved in military action all over the place. It invaded South Vietnam, practically destroyed Indochina, invaded Iraq, uh, uh, elicited a, a Sunni-Shia conflict, which is now tearing the region to shreds. Uh, don't have to run through the rest of the record, but the United States moves very quickly to military action uh, unilaterally. It can sometimes can get some allies to go along. In this case, it can't even do that. Uh, and it's just a routine. The United States is self-immunized from international law, which bans the threat or use of force. And this is taken for granted here. So, for example, when President Obama repeatedly says uh, all options are open with regard to Iran, that's a violation of fundamental international law. It says we are using the threat of force in violation of international law uh, to which we are self-immunized. Uh, there's nothing new about this. Uh, can you think of any other country that's uh, used military force 
uh, internationally on anything remotely like the scale of the United States uh, during these uh, seven decades when, uh, uh, according to Obama, we've been the anchor of global security. Well, Noam Chomsky, uh, supporters of the U.S. plan say that the only reason uh, that Assad agreed to hand over or relinquish control over chem chemical weapons was because of the threat of, of military force, of U.S. military force. And what interest does the U.S. have in striking Syria militarily? Uh, the first comment is, is correct. The threat and use of force can be effective. So, for example, the uh, Russia was able to control Eastern Europe for 50 years with the threat and occasional use of force. Uh, uh, Hitler was able to take over Czechoslovakia uh, with the threat of force. Yes, it often works, no doubt. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons it's banned under international, uh, under international law. Uh, the reason uh, um, the pretexts for uh, for uh, um, uh, imposing, uh, for, for carrying out a forceful act, have generally declined uh, to the point that even the British government hasn't accepted them. Congress is apparently going to reject them. And uh, the United States, uh, the government resorted, resorted to the, what is usually the last, the last resort when everything else fails, saying our credibility is at stake. And that's correct. U.S. credibility is at stake. Obama issued an edict, and it has to be enforced. Now, that's a familiar doctrine. It's one of the leading doctrines of world affairs. The credibility of uh, powerful, violent states uh, must be maintained. Uh, it's uh, occasionally called it the mafia doctrine. It's essentially the doctrine by which the godfather uh, rules his domains within the mafia system. That's one of the leading principles of world order. Credibility has to be maintained. Uh, that has many variants. Uh, sometimes it's called the domino theory. Uh, if we don't impose our will here, uh, the dominoes will start to fall. Others will begin to be disobedient. In the case of Chile, 40 years ago, go back to that, uh, what Latin Americans call the first 9-11, uh, Henry Kissinger explained that uh, 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 Chile under Allende, he said, is a virus that might spread contagion elsewhere, uh, all the way to southern Europe. Uh, he wasn't saying that uh, Chilean troops were going to land in Rome. Uh, he was concerned, rightly, that the model of peaceful parliamentary democracy might spread, in which case the contagion would spread beyond, and the U.S. system of domination would would erode. Uh, just earlier on the program, you had an interview with Saul Landau, the late Saul Landau, uh, with regard to Chile, and exactly the same doctrine applies there. Uh, the U.S. carried out, it, invaded uh, Cuba, the Bay of Pigs invasion. When that failed, Kennedy launched a, an enormous terrorist campaign murderous terrorist campaign. The goal was uh, to bring the terrors of the earth to Cuba, as Arthur Schlesinger described it. Uh, Kennedy's advisor, Latin American advisor, was in the hands of Robert Kennedy, and it was no joke. It was very serious. Now, that's been followed by uh, uh, 50 years of economic warfare, very harsh economic warfare, all unilateral. The world is overwhelmingly opposed to it. Uh, but it doesn't matter. We, as a rogue state, we do what we like. And the reasons are explicit in the internal record. Uh, the reasons, you go back to the early 60s, uh, the, early, the internal government record explains that uh, Castro is guilty of what they called successful defiance of U.S. Uh, uh, principles going back to the Monroe Doctrine, 1823. No Russians, just the Monroe Doctrine, which established in principle our right to dominate the hemisphere. The U.S. wasn't powerful enough to do it then, but that was the principle. And Castro is carrying out successful defiance of that principle. Therefore, he must, Cuba must be subjected to massive terrorism, 
uh, economic warfare and strangulation. That's been going on for 50 years. Uh, it's the same principle, the mafia principle. The same was true in Vietnam. Uh, the primary motive for the Indochina wars, going back to the early 1950s, it was presented here as the domino theory. But what that meant was, if you read the internal records, that uh, there was a fear, a justified fear, that successful independent development in Vietnam might spread through the region, might spread contagion through the region. Others would attempt the same path. Uh, Vietnam itself was of no great significance, but it might spread as far as Indonesia, which has rich resources, and uh, there, too, there might be a move towards independent development, independent of U.S. domination. And it was even feared that that might bring in Japan. Uh, John Dower, the famous Asia historian, uh, described Japan as the super domino. Uh, the U.S. was concerned, deeply concerned, that if Southeast Asia moved toward independent development, Japan would accommodate the word that was used to uh, East and Southeast Asia, becoming its uh, technological industrial center uh, and uh, creating a, 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 a system, an Asian system, in, from which the U.S. would maybe not be excluded, but at least which it wouldn't control. Now, the U.S. had fought the Second World War to prevent that. That's Japan's new order. And it was in danger of being reconstituted if Indochina gained independence. That's the domino theory. And that was understood. Um, George Bundy, uh, uh, Kennedy Johnson national security advisor, uh, in retrospect, uh, observed that uh, the Vietnam War, the United States should have called off the Vietnam War in 1965. Why 1965? Well, because in 1965, a U.S.-backed military coup took place in Indonesia, uh, slaughtering uh, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, wiping out the only mass-based political party, uh, and uh, 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 instituting a regime of torture and terror, but opening the country up to Western exploitation with its rich resources. And that meant that the Vietnam War was essentially uh, over. The U.S. had won its main objectives. It was pointless to continue it. Uh, this policy is, uh, these are major principles of world affairs, and they're understandable. And they're understood. So go back to Cuba again. Uh, when Kennedy came into office, uh, he was concerned with uh, changing Latin American policy. He developed the uh, set up a Latin American a research commission. It was headed by Arthur Schlesinger, as, as a historian, who was his advisor. And uh, they came out with a report, it was presented by Schlesinger to the president. And in it, Schlesinger described the problem of Cuba. He said, the problem of Cuba is the Castro idea of taking matters into your own hands, an idea which may have resonance uh, in other parts of Latin America, where the mass of the population is subjected to the same kind of harsh repression that they are in Cuba. And if this idea spreads, uh, the U.S. system of control erodes. Well, going back to the Middle East, it's the same. No, uh, we're going to go back to the Middle East just when we come back from break. We want to ask you about Syria and the larger Middle East context, particularly looking at Iran and looking at Israel. Um, and, of course, as you point out, this is a major date in history. 40 years ago today, September 11, 1973, in Chile, Salvador Allende died in the palace as the Pinochet forces rose to power. And it is also the 12th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a moment.
democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our guest for the hour is Professor Noam Chomsky. In 2007, Noam, Democracy Now! interviewed General Wesley Clark, the retired four-star general, who was the supreme allied commander of NATO during the Kosovo War. General Clark described how an unnamed Pentagon official, just after the September 11th attacks, talked about a memo that said the U.S. planned to take out seven countries in five years, including Syria. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon, and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, you, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but We've got a good military, and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, I said, well, don't show it to me. And I saw him a year or so ago, and I said, you remember that? He said, sir, I didn't show you that memo. I didn't show it to you. That was General Wesley Clark. I was interviewing him at the 92nd Street Y here in New York in 2007. Uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, if you could respond. Well, I think that's uh, it's it's quite plausible. The uh, the Bush administration veered slightly, not far, but slightly from the general pattern. Uh, actually, uh, the goal of U.S. policy for decades has been to control and uh, dominate those countries. But the Bush administration was more extreme. Uh, they thought they could uh, actually just, as they put it, take them out uh, and forcefully impose our own uh, regimes. Uh, not that that would be anything new. Uh, there's a long list of similar cases, uh, going back uh, to Iran uh, in 1953, uh, Guatemala in 1954. Uh, there was a assault against major assault against Indonesia in 1958, an effort to strip away the outer islands where the resources are, and uh, because they were concerned about uh, too much independence in Indonesia, that failed. Uh, invasion of Cuba failed. Uh, the the uh, murder of Lumumba, in which the U.S. was involved in the Congo, uh, destroyed Africa's major hope for development. Congo is now a total horror story. Uh, for years, the U.S. supported the Mobutu dictatorship. Uh, uh, now it's made it the worst place in the world. Uh, and on uh, right through case after case, this is standard U.S. policy. The Bush administration went beyond. Uh, they were uh, more extreme in their goals and their actions. And they had to pull back, because that was just beyond U.S. capacity. Uh, Iraq, the Iraq war was a very serious defeat for the United States, uh, unlike the Vietnam War. Uh, in the case of Indochina, it's called a defeat, but that only means that the U.S. did not achieve its maximal objectives. It did achieve its major objectives, as McGeorge Bundy well understood. It had prevented of Vietnam from moving on a path of independent development, which might have had this uh, contagious effect that Kissinger was concerned with, uh, as it was put at the time, 
uh, one rotten apple may spoil the barrel, uh, meaning just what Arthur Schlesinger and others said. Uh, if uh, you allow independent of taking matters into your own hand in one place, then it works. Uh, others will try to emulate it. System will erode. A standard uh, a principle for systems of power. Uh, the godfather of the mafia understands it perfectly well. Uh, in the uh, mafia system, if some uh, small storekeeper uh, decides not to play, pay protection money, uh, the money may not mean anything to the godfather, but he's not going to let him get away with it. And in fact, he's not just going to go in and send his goons to get the money. He's also going to beat him to a pulp, because others have to understand that disobedience is not tolerated. In international affairs, that's called credibility. Uh, the bombing of Kosovo, Wesley Clark's bombing of Kosovo, was the same. After other, uh, there were pretexts, but they collapsed. And the final one, as uh, Tony Blair and George Bush said, was we have to maintain the credibility of NATO. NATO had issued edicts, and uh, we must ensure that they're obeyed. And NATO, of course, does not mean Norway. It means the United States. No. The God if no. I could interrupt for a minute to ask you about your reflections on this anniversary of the September 11, 2001 attacks here in the United States, um, your reflections on this anniversary and also how it relates to Syria and the Middle East and what needs to be done now. Uh, I will respond to that, though. I, my own view is that we should be concentrating on the first 9-11, the one in Chile, which was a much worse attack by any dimension. But the one here was very significant. It was a major terrorist act, thousands of people killed. It's the first time since uh, uh, the War of 1812 that U.S. territory had been attacked. The United States has had remarkable security. Uh, and. Uh, uh, this, therefore, was, a, uh, aside from the atro horrible atrocity, a very significant historical event. And it changed uh, attitudes and policies in the United States uh, quite considerably. Uh, in reaction to this, uh, the uh, government was able to ram through uh, uh, the laws, uh, Patriot Act, uh, others that uh, sharply constrained civil liberties. It was able to provide pretexts for invasion of Afghanistan, invasion of Iraq, uh, destruction of Iraq, uh, consequences of spread through the region. Uh, and uh, it, it provides a—it's uh, uh, the basis for uh, uh, Obama's uh, massive terrorist war. The drone war is the most extreme uh, terrorist campaign uh, uh, that's uh, underway now, maybe the most extreme in history. And the justification for it is the same, uh, the second 9-11, 9-11-2001. So yes, it's had enormous effects on the society, on, its, uh, on, the, on attitudes, on policies. Uh, many victims throughout the world can testify to that. How do you see the situation in Syria being resolved? And now, can you tie it into um, the larger Middle East crisis? Talk about Israel-Palestine. Talk about the U.S. relationship with Iran and relationship with Saudi Arabia. Well, the Sy Syria right now is plunging into suicide. If the negotiations options that uh, Lakta Rahimi and uh, Russia and others have been pressing. If that doesn't work, uh, Syria is moving towards a kind of very bloody partition. It's likely that the Kurdish areas, which already are semi-independent, will move towards further independence, probably link up with uh, Iraqi Kurdistan adjacent to them maybe make some arrangements with Turkey. Those are already uh, in process. And the rest of Syria, what remains, will be divided between a bloody, murderous Assad regime and a collection of uh, rebel groups of varying kinds, ranging from secular democratic to murderous, brutal terrorists. That looks like the outcome for Syria. There is another part of Syria 
which is not talked about. Uh, it's occupied by Israel and annexed by Israel, it's the Golan Heights, annexed in violation of explicit Security Council orders not to annex it. Their credibility doesn't matter because Israel's an ally. So that's another part of Syria. Uh, that brings us to uh, Israel-Palestine. Uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, Secretary Kerry, Secretary of State Kerry, uh, appealed to the European Union uh, to uh, continue to support illegal, criminal uh, Israeli settlement projects in the West Bank. It wasn't put in those words, uh, but the way it is put is that Europe had taken the quite appropriate step of uh, trying to draw back from support for uh, Israeli operations uh, in the illegal settlements. Incidentally, that the settlements are illegal is not even in question. Uh, that's been determined by the highest authorities, the Security Council uh, of the United Nations, the uh, International Court of Justice. In fact, up until the Reagan administration, uh, the U.S. also called them illegal. Uh, Reagan changed that to an obstacle to peace, and Obama has weakened it still further to not helpful to peace. Uh, but the U.S. is virtually alone in this. The rest of the world uh, accepts the judgment of the Security Council of the International Court of Justice that the settlements are illegal, not just the expansion of the settlement, but the settlements themselves. And uh, Europe had pulled back from support for the settlements, and Kerry called on Europe not to do that uh, because the pretext was that this would interfere with the uh, so-called peace negotiations that he's uh, set up, uh, which are a total farce. I mean, the peace negotiations are carried out under preconditions, U.S.-imposed preconditions, which virtually guarantee failure. There are two basic preconditions. We have 15 one... seconds. Pardon? We have 15 seconds. Oh, okay. One precondition is that the U.S. run them. The U.S. is a participant, not neutral. The other is that Israeli expansion of settlements must continue. Uh, no peace negotiations can continue under those conditions. Well, Noam, we want to thank you very much for being with us, spending the hour with us. Noam Chomsky, world-renowned political dissident, linguist and author, institute professor emeritus at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he's taught for more than half a century and has written more than 100 books. Um, we will link to our past interviews with him at our website, democracynet.org. You can also go to our website to see a number of new interviews about the U.S. back coup in Chile that took place 40 years ago today, September 11, 1973. I just spoke with the judges who later arrested and indicted General Augusto Pinochet and with the forensic specialist who exhumed the bodies of ousted President Salvador Allende and singer Victor Jara. Also on our website, you can see our interactive timeline of the voices of dissent surrounding the September 11, 2001 attack here at home.